Hello, everyone. My name is Gael, and I'm the last thing between the beers later, and, um, and I know you wanted to go that quickly. But we're going to discover a bit of YAML on how to use YAML in your day-to-day -day tasks. So how to use PowerShell with YAML. But first of all, who's been using YAML before? Just so I have an idea. All right. There's actually probably 50% of the people here who haven't touched YAML yet. So I want to really, like, we're going to start with the basics of YAML, just writing it down to show what type of structure you can have. And uh, if you have any question for this first part, feel free to ask, and then I want to make sure everything's clear. So we're going to get to know uh, the format, the basic syntax, basic types, uh, lists, and dictionaries or hash tables. Um, a bit of features and tooling, the features you can have in YAML as a, as a language, declarative language, and uh, the capabilities, and in practice, what you should be using, or probably more, what you shouldn't be using uh, when you play with YAML. And, and then we'll try to do stuff with YAML, and, and giving you, if you've got time, we're gonna, I'm going to give you an example that uh, I tend to use. Um, YAML is very good for configuration, and I'll get into a bit more details, and I use that a lot uh, with DSC for managing the configuration data. So let's start with a quick demo to see where it goes. So YAML stands for YAML Atom Markup Language. Very nice. So let's switch to this. I'll just create a new file to start with. And I'm using VS Code for the example. And I'll just do a quick test on the extension YAML. So is everyone using VS Code? Because that's not familiar. Still people using ISE as an example? All right, so the problem is if you try to use ISE or if you try to use Notepad++, I'm going to show you with Notepad++. Um, it's OK. You have some syntax alighting, but it's not very, very good. So as an example, there's a mistake in this YAML file. There's something in this YAML file which is not allowed, and uh, it doesn't tell you. So if I try to copy that, here? Well, it doesn't tell you either. So that's the first thing. If you have the right tool, it makes it much easier. So let's go and look at the extensions. And I already have one there which is not enabled. I'm going to enable this. Do, do, do. There you go. You have, with just this extension, you can see that there's already mistakes in my files. So I'll try to find what's going on. And if I just over, I will, oops, oh, sorry. I have a duplicate key. So as you can see, I've got key here, and I've got a key here. All right? So if I rename that one and save, the first error goes away. All right? So let's clear that up. I know you've seen I have VS Code. I have a YAML extension, which is coming from Red Hat, this one. I enabled it. I know I can start typing, and then my experience is going to be much better. So I'll start. Oops, sorry, I'm not in the right place. So the first thing is, what is YAML as a general? It's a serialization format. So everyone's familiar with JSON? Everyone writing JSON? JSON files? Not that many, actually. So there's PSD1 is probably the one you're most familiar with. The problem is, as soon as you go outside of the PowerShell community, there's many people that would don't know that. So the most common uh, language to data serialization would be JSON. And this is what you use for uh, interacting with APIs most of the time. There's still a bit uh, of XML, for instance, out there, but uh, JSON is really gaining in uh, popularity. So YAML is just a way to represent data, unstructured data, in a text file. So if I start by creating a key and a value, this is the most basic uh, element you can have, or commonly you will have, into, um, into a YAML file. And that is, the first thing you're doing is, is it's a map. So in PowerShell, the map is usually the hash table. There's all the maps that we're going to discover, and we're going to see all the map between a, a YAML file and how you use it in um, in PowerShell. So when you have a hash table, you also have some different types. You can have an array, as an example. And the way to specify how an array works is with simple dash. There's different notations I'm going to go through, but that's the most common one when you use YAML files. And that means you have an array, which is the key 
of the root element. And this array will have a first string. So that's value one. And I can add another value in the same way. And you can see that it's an array. And actually, VS Code is clever. Here it tells me this is an array. So I'm going to go with value three. Oh, sorry. Value three. So far, so good. Easy, right? So those types, uh, so that's, those items in, in the array are just simple strings. But what we can do is actually have another key, which let's say the key is named hash table. Sorry. And within that uh, hash table, I can have sub keys. So that's the same kind when you have a PS custom object in PowerShell. You can have different layers of objects. So it's nested objects. So in the same way, I will have a sub key. And then that could be a hash table as well. And that's going to be a sub sub key, which will have a value of one as an example. And you can see I have no errors. So that's valid YAML. So that doesn't tell you much besides how to write very basic YAML file. I'm going to go back a bit, so then you've seen a bit of YAML. I'm going to go back a bit on the slide, and then we'll get back to this. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. All right. I'll just touch a bit on this now, and then I'm probably going to get back to it. So you can see this is the basic way to have the data. Um, it's very easy for me to write it because uh, you, you don't see uh, me typing space because it's already done most of the time by the IDE. So VS Code is automatically doing it for me. It's clever enough to help me out. And if I miss, for instance, one space, so delete, and I save that file, it should tell me that it's wrong. It should, but it's not. Ah, sorry. There's a... All right. The problem with the extensions doesn't always pick it up. Anyway, I'll try doing this. Uh, I probably need to reload the extension. I'll do that. I'll do that in a bit. Sorry, Tim Gertz. So the first principle, um, the first principle with um, those objects. So this, you can think about an object. A PS custom object is the same principle, and you have a PS custom object which has one property which is called hash table. On this PS custom object, um, with the property hash table as another sub object with a property of sub key one. We, and the way to, ex, to um, create this hierarchy of objects is using the space, the white space, and you can count there's two white space. And that's one of the character, characteristics. That's the way you tell it. You don't need brackets. You don't need um, uh, double quotes. You don't need these kind of things. It will only uh, require you to have the right indentation. And that usually is the first problem when people write YAML, is because they don't know how to organize this. But once you, uh, you have the right ID and the right tools, and uh, you are a bit used to this, it's much easier to write, because you don't have to add many um, elements. So far, so good? All right. I'll do a bit of an experiment after that, and we'll get back to the codes. It will make a bit more sense about what type of objects when we get to the PowerShell code, so then you can relate between one and another. So we have different file formats. We have the PSD one. So why bother with YAML? That's a good question. And as I said, um, many, uh, many people outside the PowerShell community are not used to PSD1. So you can't really serialize something and give it to a C-sharp developer and say, hey, this is my PSD1. So you need a different way for them to understand. So most of the time, if they're C-sharp developers, they probably know JSON. So the question is, well, JSON is more common. Why not using JSON? And, and JSON is perfectly readable. And that's correct. You can read JSON. So writing JSON in an ID is not too hard. So why do we still have YAML? And why YAML is getting a bit more popularity in, um, in the configuration world, especially? So when you have a small tool, most of the time now, whether it's uh, Azure DevOps or it's, um, uh, for instance, um, any pipelines work, any DevOps tools at the moment, most of the time they use, uh, they use YAML or maybe they use Tomal and a bit of YAML. So it's not really a demo, but I want to do a quick uh, black dot experiment because it's a bit late in the evening. Everyone wants to go outside, get some beers. I just want a small experiment. So this is a black dot. 
And I will have a few slides with different numbers of black dots. And I want to see how fast you are to tell me how many black dots you have. So this one is one, okay? Not too hard. Ready? Ready for next slide? I want you to shout the number of, of dots, okay? Three. Three. Yeah, good. Okay? <laughs> yeah, try, try. Yeah, 15. That's good. Uh, it takes a bit more time. Oh, that was much quicker. Yeah, good. People know. Uh, not that many people, yeah. 15. Yeah, I'm not very, like, I don't want to do that in PowerPoint, you know. But you get, you get the idea that depending on how the data is structured and how you can visualize it, then you have different time to react with this. And that's really a very, very good principle to think about because whatever system you design, that's very important. Whatever, whenever you're doing automation in general, you need always this loop. You have the perception, the cognition, and the action. So it's called the perception, cognition, ac action loop. And that's very useful. If you design a system, it will change over time. If you design automation, it will change over time. And that's a key element for everything you're doing. Can it change? So when you build something, if you write a script, if it's a 2,000 line script, a single monolith, will you be able to change it very easily? No, so you need to probably extract at least the data. You're not going to outcode the data. So that's the first way to abstract the data. So then it's easier to just look at the parameters to that script, as long as you trust it. And then you will, you will only manage the code whenever you need to, but uh, the data will be able to change a bit more. So the more data you extract, and the more easy it to um, look at this data and, and understand what's going on, then you can make a change, make sure it works, validate, and then go again. And, and that's a principle which is very famous in DevOps, which is the OODA loop by um, John Boyd. The principle is you, you observe first, then you orient, you, find to, you try to find a way to improve the system. Then you decide and you act, and then you go again. So the OODA loop is a very famous uh, uh, principle in, in DevOps and in general. So then the quicker you do your loop, the smaller the batch, the changes you're doing, the more, uh, the faster you go and you, you improve. It's like if you have a complicated script, you have 10 variables, and you change the, term at one, the 10 variables at once, it's going to be very hard to carry on and to know what you're doing. So the principle is make sure it's easy to understand what you have, lay out very simply the input of your scripts or automation in general, and make small changes. So this is another way, still with the black dots, to compare the two documents. Everyone can read, so on the left, obviously, it's the JSON, and on the right, it's YAML. So it's very easy for everyone to read um, both. It just feels that it's slightly quicker, and I, we say terse, there's less information on the YAML file. It's a bit more direct into the hierarchy of the data. And it's a bit, because it, the use of white spaces, it's a bit clearer to see uh, where the indentation is and where the structure is. And this is a compressed forms in, um, in JSON. You can do something very similar in YAML, and I'll explain why, but I think it's not even worth to put it there. It would be the same size, most likely, and it would be very similar to this, but I don't want to give it away too early. The, the thing is, YAML is a superset of JSON. But before this, I will just get back and then think here. Do, so, Hands up if you think uh, JSON is better than YAML. JSON, better than YAML? Okay, you think JSON? Okay, couple. YAML is better than JSON? It, it's a stupid question. <laughs> yeah, you go right. It's a stupid question. The two are actually good, but it's very different purpose. And, and that's the idea, right? Whenever you do system to system communication, let's say you send data to an API. It's usually much better to have a compressed JSON, and then you send it. You're sure like, it's quite human-readable if you really want to go through the logs. But uh, otherwise, if it's a human writing it, JSON is not necessarily the best tool. Um, YAML is good to, exp to showing the data in a very terse way and very structured data. And, and this is one of the great quality of YAML. It doesn't replace JSON in many cases, but it's a bit um, easier to read and easier to see the data. And your brain gets trained as you, as you use it more, and it's a bit JSON. Everyone, 
or many developers think that uh, JSON is very easy to write because they are trained to do it, but when you go through a lot of configuration data, it's easier when you have less brackets, quotes, and then other artifacts like this. Any questions so far? No, you're good? All right. I'll get back a, a bit in the code, and then I'll go to my start here. Uh, I'll close that for now. There we go. So these are some um, basic elements. So you're all familiar with hash tables in, um, in PowerShell, and this is what a map is. So it's a hash table. It's a key value pair. So you have the first key here, the second key here, and that's another value, right? So I'm just writing a hash table right now. And you're telling me, well, it's the same in PowerShell. When you have a hash table, you can't have two elements with the same key, correct? So that one is complaining because I already have that one here. So I'm not allowed to do this, but if I do a unique name, the error disappear, right? So this is just a hash table. And in the same hash table, one element with the key named array is actually containing an array. And that array has a string, an integer, and a Boolean. So basic types are actually recognized. You can see here, for instance, uh, the, the color, the, the syntax coloring is actually showing different. That, maybe you can't, say, maybe you can. Yeah, it's actually better on that one. So this is purple. And then you've got a different color for those. And as I said, you can have nested keys in there. And this is the compact notation for arrays. And this is the compact notation as you do pretty much in JSON. So the, the, the principle is that actually YAML and JSON are siblings. So, um, so we'll get into more details, but that the syntax is very similar. And in some ways, it's compatible. And then you've got some weird notations about, um, about YAML, how to get a long string with different uh, return characters into one blob of text if you want. And you've got this one, which is, and the pipe. And I'm going to show you exactly the difference when we get to the PowerShell, which is going to be right now. Uh, any question on the structure so far? Is it good? This is just a quick overview of the type of data you can have. And that relates to arrays, scalars, so string, um, string integer, and uh, Boolean. Yes, go ahead. What happens if you want to represent from net the character one? The character one? So that's a good question. Let's say I want to have another nested two here. And I want it to be the. Uh, that's the number integer, and then I just want to have, oops, sorry, a string. So let me do this. For instance, this it doesn't show well with the color syntax. So that would be a string one, and you can use this, and you can use this for two. That would work, right? We'll see if we, if we, when we do with the PowerShell, we can probably experiment a bit and see a bit more this kind of quirks you can have there. All right? Any other question? Yes, it's a different notation. So the point of uh, YAML is really to uh, have a nice and easy to read um, uh, document, because it's a document. You, you document your data, so then someone else can review it and act on it and maybe change something, right? And, and the problem with the compact notation is usually not, for two reasons, is usually not uh, the best. So it doesn't scale properly, and it's not as obvious as when you have um, the dash and everything under this. And the other problem is, for instance, if you're using with PowerShell, you convert from YAML to an object, and from the object back to YAML, it will not use, at least using the current module I use, it will not uh, be that notation, it will use the other notation. So you will lose, or you will translate it for you. So that's dangerous not to use what you get back, because then um, you do not necessarily um, have the same number of lines, and then you might be a bit confused. But otherwise, it's exactly the same principle. On that one, with the curly brackets, this is just an object, a stable. OK? So far, so good? All right, let's dive into the PowerShell now. It's been too long without the PowerShell. All right. 
So the, the PowerShell module I use, uh, there's, if you look in the gallery, I think there's about uh, two modules at least, maybe three modules, and they're all based on the same DLL, which is a YAML.NET uh, DLL. Um, I used that one because I had uh, quite a bit of success using that one. I think the other one is fine, it's just slightly different uh, interface, but uh, because there's the same DLL underneath, it's probably the same features. So importing the module, let's bring that up. Uh, is, that, is that okay for everyone, size and color? Yeah. So I just import the module, and I just show you all the commands you have in the module. Yeah, there's only two. So it's pretty simple, right? You convert from YAML, and you convert to YAML. So I'm just going to look at the file I was just using, so this one. And I will just convert from YAML. You see the trick first that people, many people actually uh, miss when they start doing the convert for YAML is to using the dash row. Who doesn't know what dash row in the, de the get content does? You don't know. Okay, so that's fine. Dash row actually looks at the wall file and take everything as one blob of text and send it back to the pipeline. If you don't use the dash row, what get content does, it takes every line and then send through the first line to the pipeline, second line, pipeline, third line, pipeline. And that means it will create as many YAML um, objects, or it will try to convert every YAML object as a single piece of array if you want. So we want the wall document to be represented there. Okay? And we convert it from YAML. So let me just clear that first. And then I'll press F8. So converting from YAML, I get just a nice object. People are used to JSON, so maybe I will just do convert from YAML, and I will reconvert to JSON. Convert to JSON. And I'll do F8. And that's, that's your JSON object. So you see, you have the key, String, key two, you have a nested object within key two, and then you have an array with different values, and then you have string two. And you can see that the string two actually is slightly different than the way it was represented, right? I'll just get back to this in a bit. So, uh, I'll put that into variable, just so it's easy to use, and then I'll show you the strings. So the first string can I just uh, split on the right, so then you can see here which one I'm talking about. If you can't see something, just let me know if it's too small, but uh, I can hardly do better than this. Um, so the string element is this one. And you can see that I'm using that symbol to say, well, whatever comes next is going to be text, right? And uh, you can see that it puts it together when I get to uh, the, the PowerShell. And when I look at string two, F8, it actually doesn't. So this is because you have different types of things. So one is wrapping it around, and the other one um, is just leaving it in the same way. And this is something I don't think you can do, or you definitely can't do nicely when you use JSON. So JSON, you need to have either one big block of text, or you need to break it down with a plus sign, and then you need to um, be additive with the different bits of, of a string that you want to put together. Question with this? So far, so good. All right. And I wanted to show you the object. So I say the first object is a hash table. It's pretty convenient. Most of the time, people deal with hash table. So I'm just convert this object back to, uh, to YAML. And as you can see, which uh, probably should be the same as we've got here, I'll go back up. We've got the key, the value, the, R the where's the array? Anyone knows? Why is the array there? What's missing? Ordered. So there's no order kept. And if you use JSON, you have the same problem. You write it in one way, and then it doesn't actually keep uh, the order. It's actually not the same, if I remember correctly. You can let me if I'm wrong. But on PowerShell uh, 6, I think they fixed that. I think JSON now it can keep the order, but I can't remember exactly. But on this one, the order is not kept, which is not very convenient. The good thing is 
There's actually a parameter for convert, convert from YAML, which allows you to keep the order. And there's a trick with this. So let's do this. Same object that we have. And then I will convert back that to YAML. And I will double check again against uh, my source here. I've got a key value. Oh, array is now in the right order. It's in the right place, right? And then you've got test, one, true. It's still the same order. So that actually conserved the order. But now there's a trick with PowerShell. What object type do you think that's going to be? Is it going to be a hash table? Yeah, it's a trick, right? So, and this annoyed me because before I, I saw what was going on. So this is an ordered dictionary. And ordered dictionary is a kind of a weird object because it can have two types of behavior. So I'm going to demonstrate. This, this is pure PowerShell, but it's something you need to know if you use that module and you try to uh, interpret some YAML uh, in your script. So the first thing is, I, I created, so this is a type accelerator in PowerShell that tells me this hash table that I'm creating needs to be ordered. All right? So when I create this, I have my object one here, and that's just an empty hash table. So if I do get type, oops, sorry. That's an ordered dictionary. So hash table converted to ordered dictionary. That's fine, right? And this is the actual full type, and that's another way to create an object, right? So I'm just creating a new order dictionary. Same thing. That's another way to create this object. So I'm just going to prove to you that it's the same type of object. All right? So far, so good. And I'm going to add a key value pair. It's called key, the string, and the value is value. All right? And then What's going to happen when I do this? If I add another element to that, object one is an ordered dictionary. What will I get? Do do do, an error. So the problem is, you have two keys with the same, um, it's the same letters if you want, but it's not the same case. So it's case uh, case insensitive. You can't have two keys with the same content, and the case doesn't matter. So, as you can see, I only have one, only the first one has been added. But, on this is, remember, it's the same type. So, in the same type, if I actually add the first key to this object 2, and then the same key but uh, capitalized, it actually works. So, what if I do object 2? I'm wondering what's going on. Well, I have the two, but two different keys, but it is the same object. What happened? Any clue? It's actually because this object has different overloads. So this is calling directly the class on trying to say, hey, I want a new object of that class. So if I remove, so this would be to create a new object, and that is to tell me um, every overloads that you have for the creation of that object. So by doing so, I can see there's different overload definitions. The new is the one I used, but there's another one. It could be capacity. At the moment, I don't really care. I want it to be extensible. But this one is the problem. You can create an order dictionary that, that ignore the case or that doesn't, or the, which is case sensitive. So if you, uh, if you ever come across this problem, at least you will know that uh, you don't have to, wait to look for all the problem where it's coming from. So I can do... If I uh, give a parameter to this one, I can say, hey, I want you to ignore the case. And that will be the same behavior as the first one we created. So I'm just going to run that. And I can try again on this object 3 to create the first element. And then the second element will fail because uh, of the case sensitivity. All right? Clear so far? Yeah? So uh, there's another way, so I'll get to, yeah. So if you create it like this, and then you want to convert it, it's a, it's a trick which is sometimes easy when you want to play with. You create, and you add a value, 
And uh, you say, oh, well, actually, this one is case sensitive, and I don't want it to be case sensitive anymore. So I'm just going to take a copy, and I will merge it to an ordered dictionary. So then um, it will remove the, the case sensitivity. So I'm going to run this one. And this one will not be allowed anymore. That's just a quick trick. If you ever need it, it's there. Any questions so far? You understand? All right. So let's uh, get back to OPS one. Let's get back to this one quickly. So I will just um, take my time. It's fine. So you've seen the, the compression here, uh, and you can do the same in YAML, but it's missing the point of YAML. So YAML is a superset of JSON. When I say they were siblings, they're very similar, and actually YAML is just uh, based on JSON and with uh, extra, if you want, characteristics, which means it doesn't require all the same syntax uh, that JSON has. Uh, JSON is really intended to be human-readable. That means it's meant to be readable when you look at a log, but it's not really meant to be writable. Like it's not a human, it's not something we expect human to write. That was the intent. That has changed since then. And this is why, uh, as an example, you can't, in basic JSON, you can't add um, uh, comments to it. So if you are using configuration data for whatever, if you have a script that needs to get some information as parameters and you put that into a JSON file, you can't say why you choose that because you can't put a comment, which has changed. I know there's a JSON C, which is a new standard, if you want, that supports it. And this is what actually VS Code is using. When you change the parameters in VS Code, it's a JSON file, but that supports uh, comments. Good? So that my, that's my opinion, is JSON is best for data interactions. So if you're contacting an API and you communicate between two systems, then JSON is probably your best bet because um, it's, it's secure enough and it's the most common things that you can find and any system, and for instance, PowerShell by default can just convert from or convert to. It's, native, it's a native command. YAML, you need to have the right PowerShell modules I showed to be able to do those conversions. But YAML is best for human to system interface. It's if you want to write data to a system so that you understand what's going on, you say it's a manual thing, then YAML is best because it's easier on the eye. It's easier to see what's going on. It's easier when you have a lot of data that you want to merge together or you want to see. And I'm going to show you maybe an example about that. So far, so good. Questions? Questions about um, YAML? Are you happy to write YAML? Can you do it like tomorrow? It's fine? Yeah? OK. Oh, the things you should avoid. Let me show you. So the same as, um, let me just close those. The same as JSON, there's a lot of things, a lot of features in, um, in JSON and also in YAML. And my opinion is some of them you probably shouldn't use. And this is an example of this. It's very, it, it's very interesting, but for some, like for a few reasons, I'm going to explain. I'd rather not do this. So, what is this doing? You create a first. So, in this object, you create. This is an array with different steps. Easy. Because it's an array, uh, the key don't overlap. It's different items in the array, right? And the first time you, within this array, the first element is an object. And the first key of that object is command with the, um, the value is start PowerShell. And this bit here is a label. We actually create a reference. This is our object ID 001. It's just an arbitrary number. I, I call it that way. And then what I can do is actually reference to it. So you can reference this object. What is it going to do? Well, let's find out. So if I, um, I can't type, so I'm just going to use that one. <laughs> so I do the same principle. I get content with the file I just had. Actually, I'm going to split that. So then you can see it. Open on the site. There we go. 
Uh, actually, that's not going to good. Right. I'll do this. So I'm going to open that file and put it into a variable, my variable object, and I'm going to display it there. Oops, sorry. F8. You see, I've got my my steps. Step, 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 four steps, okay? Everyone knows what's going to be in step one. So uh, it's object, sorry, and object zero, which is my step one. I have command. Uh, oops, sorry. So object zero, command. Uh, what I'm doing wrong? Sorry? Value, thank you. No, uh, Stable. All right, so far so good, that's what we expect. So now if I go to the same element, but on my one, uh, zero, one, two, what do I get? But it's not defined, so it's just a reference to the other objects, and then when you go to PowerShell, it's actually automatically, this is the DLL behind, behind the module doing this for you, it just gives you the data which has been referenced, so you don't have to repeat yourself. Great feature, should you use it? Probably not. The problem is, as I said, you use uh, YAML, especially to be very uh, declarative to your user. If you use this kind of feature, if the user is not advanced enough, then probably it's not very uh, user-friendly. So that's a great feature. If you really have some, a lot of repetition, uh, that's a way to avoid the repetition by just referencing another object. Should you use it? Probably not. There's all the features that exist in, in YAML, and, and one of them uh, is uh, specific types. You can declare types. And as an example, um, this module I don't think supports uh, these custom types. Or like um, another thing that you can accept, uh, JSON as a schema, and because YAML is a superset of JSON, it also supports some schema. Should you use schema? Maybe not. I would really suggest that you use PowerShell to validate the data you have in input because it's only to go to your PowerShell. So if you have a PowerShell class, as an example, the PowerShell class, whenever you instantiate it based on this data that you have in YAML, should do the validation for you. Make sense? So far so good? Yeah. This one? All right, good question. So I'm going to take this, copy that into a new file, and I'm going to um, show you exactly what it looks like, the same things without the label and reference, and then I'm going to explain uh, what's in there. So I'll just reuse my test here. I'll remove everything. I paste this. I'll explain this in a second. I can remove it for now because it's safe. I will explain that in a, in a moment. That explains... Uh, that decri describes the beginning of the document. And that means that's one document. That means you can have more than one YAML document into one file. I'll, get, I'll probably get to that in a bit. But you don't really need to know this. It's just a reminder for me to explain it. So this is how it looks like. And then this is what the reference is doing under the hood. Makes more sense? All right, I just removed the references. No, no, no I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to explain what this one does. So actually, maybe if you see it in PowerShell, it will be easier, so I'll do a get content row, sorry for the alias, and that's, it's called test YAML, all right, and I convert from YAML, all right? And that gives me an object. So I'm put, going to put this into my object one, and I will put that a bit bigger so you see directly into here. Object one, and what do I have? Do you prefer JSON? Yeah. 
You have your first, you can see in JSON, this is telling you that it's an array. If you are, if you, if you are familiar with uh, JSON, when you start learning YAML, that's the, that's the way I recommend just playing with this. You just convert from one to another, and then you will see other two um, uh, compare to each other. And that, that will help you uh, writing the right thing. And um, this is an array, and it's an array of objects, right? And within that object, the first one is the key, and then it's got another object within it, nested, which has a key and a value. So that's what it does. So if I look at my PowerShell object, um, the, I have an array, right? So I can do count. I have four items. If I go to the first element, I have a step and a command. And then from that first element, if I look at the step, I have my command. So if I look at what command it is, command, a command, it's start PowerShell. Sorry, say again? Skip the name. Yeah, yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no name for the array, yes. Uh, okay, so if you want to put that onto another key, you can start your document by having a key. Ah, that's a trick, actually. It's good to understand how much the indentation is important. So I'm creating a root key, and I want to move all my data under that key. So that, that means the first key will have an array under it. So I'm going to say root. I'm just calling it root. And then I'm just going to move this. I press tab. And this is two indent. And that's going to be under. So I have my root key. And under that, I have, uh, yeah, I have my array. Good? That answers the question? You. You're welcome. Any more questions? OK. Uh, how much do I have? Five minutes, right? Ish. Oh, perfect. All right, do you want to see a bit more advanced things you can do with this? Yeah, all right. So as I, uh, where did it go? Oh, no, datum, sorry. I was scared for a second. So let me close this. And I'll get back to you. So, um, so I started doing. I wanted to to do this uh, basic YAML because uh, the workshop we did last year was on DSC, and DSC is kind of famous to be uh, tricky to manage configuration data. As your configuration grow, as the configuration grow, you have a lot of data you need to manage, and you don't want to repeat yourself. And if you just use PSD one without any tricks. It's actually hard. There's many, many tricks you can do, and you can ask Daniel over there. We did a, a session last year with some DSC tricks for managing uh, your environment. But um, I took an approach which is much more close to what Puppet does with the uh, Hira. Hira is a way to have uh, data in uh, YAML text files that you can have into your Git um, uh, repositories. And you can have a YAR key, hence the name, hierarchy of data. Um, I use the same principle to apply it to PowerShell and in a module which is called Datum, on which I use to manage DSC environments. And this is the kind of data that you have. Uh, if you're familiar with DSC, the idea is you will, have, you will have a list of nodes, and those nodes will need to have configuration data, so then they can apply the right configuration. So it all starts with nodes, and this is where I've got my nodes, and I separated them into different folders for dev and prod environment, and within those, I have data like server one. Server one's got the node name and some other properties. And one of the property is the role. And I attached role one. And I tell it, well, this is the location. And this is an example property. And that is some more advanced feature that I'm probably not going to cover today. But uh, the module I created allows you to explore this data directly uh, from the common line or directly from um, PowerShell. So let me just clear that, and I will go to the demo here. I forgot. So if you want to install, uh, Datum is the name of the uh, module I created, and PowerShell YAML is the one we just used before. It's just a dependency. And uh, I will just make sure the module is imported. 
and I hope I have installed that module. Yeah, that's fine. And the way Datum works, it looks at the configuration file in YAML, which has got a lot of uh, information as how the structure of the data you have. So I tell it this is the folders where I've got data in it, and within that I have some information about the layers of my data. One has precedence over the other. If you have a node, this is very specific. If you have a role, this is less specific. And you may have defaults that applies to every single node you have. So this is just a way to represent the hierarchy, and I'll, maybe I'll explain a bit later. But what's important at the moment is the, the things you can do with the YAML. So you can see all my data is in folders, structured, and that explains the infrastructure I've got. So you have a lot of data you want to aggregate together and you want to be able to explore. So by creating, I should do this, demo. I can load this definition file, which is my datum.yaml, which is the configuration for the module itself. And I will just run this, and what I get is an object, which is my datum, dollar datum object. So what I've got here actually represents the first layer, if you want, the first, the root of where my datum is, my datum YAML is. So I've got all nodes, which is the first element, and then I've got side data, all nodes, roles, right? So if I want to go, so AD and some, some are not defined in my, in my datum file, that's why they don't show up. So you can be selective about what file, or what folder you want to load. If you see here, I have all nodes, site data, environments, and roles, which is the only one that have been loaded. Ooh. So this is the root of my object. And now I can do is, I can actually explore using the dot notation of the variables, and I'm pressing tab. This is where my dev environment is. So if I enter and I see, oh, I've got my servers already accessible from here. And this is my data actually living in the YAML files. And what, is, uh, what this module is, uh, is using under the hood is just PowerShell.yaml. So if I want to see what server one is, I do this and I have the data that I add into my YAML files. And you can reuse that directly into your script. That makes sense? All right? So you can see the node, uh, the node here has got the role name rolled one, right? So what I can do is I can go and open, open node one, my dev environment. Let's just change it to, um, actually, I'm just going to change the location for now. And I do call, which is Kuala Lumpur. So if I do, this, or oh, I just changed the file, I didn't reload anything, right? But actually, it just, every time it will look at the file. It's kind of caching, so if, if you, um, if, you if, if the file hasn't changed since it's been loaded, it's just gonna use the cache. But if the file has changed, then it's gonna re-read uh, re again from the file. And that can be useful when you do some debugging and you want to find some things. And this is something, you see, there's one command to load the, the database, if you want, and the database is just files. And well, then you can use that in your script directly. And with that, imagine. Make sense? Easy? So now, a bit more specific to DSC, but that can apply to uh, many types of settings. Things about the GPOs. When you have a group policy objects, there's different places where you can apply GPOs. And some will override others. So you have a layer system. You have one layer which takes precedence onto another layer. Your data can be the same. You can have a layer which overrides the, the others. So if I change back that to London. So that was one of the examples. And I will just load the data the same way I would do in DSC. But you, can, you don't have to do this. It's just because it's a DSC-specific example just loading the data in a way that I like, which is, if you're familiar with DSC, that's the kind of data DSC expects, the configuration data DSC expects. But the only point is getting a node, a given node, which that's going to be my server one. So if I do, oh, sorry. I do node here, I just have my server one. I just loaded it. Sorry. That's my server one. You see, environment dev, role one, London. 
So this, um, this modular route called datum supports layers the same way as GPO does, but everything is defined in text. And this is the layer that I defined. And the top one is the most specific, which uh, is really attached to the node in this example. And the bottom one is the most generic. That applies to everything which um, has something defined in that layer. So when you're looking at some data for a given node, it will say, for example, is it specifically defined at the node level, at the role level, at the location, or is it applying to everyone? And by using the lookup, you can see this is one of the key elements. And I'm going to just run this. And there's only one uh, elements for configurations. And I'm going to show you where this is coming from. And it's role one. And role one's got the configuration name shared one. So it's looking through the hierarchy based on the relationship that you define into your datum YAML here. And this is technically a path. Just that path is dynamic. And what you can do with this is now you can merge data together. You have something you define at the node level, something you define at your location level, or something you define, um, uh, let's say, for all the machines you have. You don't have to repeat yourself. You can merge the data together. And that's the example I'm going to do before I set you free. Yeah. And uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. So the only thing I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to sh run this now before I make the change. So this is the data I get. Uh, this is the current data that is being defined. So uh, just look at merge int array. So it's one, three, four. And this data is coming from um, the dev environment, if I remember correctly, which is environment dev. This is the data I've got here. Merge int array, 134. So now I will change the role to use merging test. And this one in merge int array has got 2, 4, 5. And I want to be able to merge one with the other. So I will tell this module to say, well, take this data that you have at this layer, this data at this layer, and you can either replace it, or you can just merge them together. So by changing the role here, yeah. And then doing another lookup on the configuration. Oh, actually, that's not the one I wanted. That's the one I want. And you see now that merge int array has merged the two things together. But you can go much further than this. This is just a simple array. You can merge hash tables. And that means you can merge hash tables based on specific keys. So if you have a list of packages, you can say, I want this package name and this version. And if those two match, then you will merge all the other parameters you can give to these packages. And I've used that, and it's still in use, I know, in companies, um, using chocolatey, for instance. You say, I want to define my chocolatey package to be those for this site, and I want this to be specific to that node, and I want for every other machines in the, my environment, I want to have this basic package, like Git, as an example. And you merge things together. So that's a very more advanced system, but if you want to have a play or if you have questions, feel free to grab me. Am I good? Any question? Yes, go ahead. Well, if I have uh, my own mobile app, yes. and um, well, I have a standard setup for, for a server, and I, in the value pair, I have to have three options for the value. Is there some way to validate that on the phone? No. Yes, sorry. So I'm repeating the question. So the question is, and I will probably say it slightly differently, but tell me if I'm wrong. So if you have, uh, if you have, um, so you have a YAML file. I'm going to give an example, which is merging test. This one has already a lot of data. HK1 from role, HK3 from role. So if I type something there, the question is, can I have something uh, forbidding me to uh, entering the wrong data. Let's say this is not allowed. That's the question, right? So, so there's no way, natively, there's no way to stop you that. If you wanted to do this in YAML, this is where um, a schema would come in. And that would be useful to have a schema telling you what data you can and cannot do. 
uh, that's something which is I don't recommend doing in YAML because it's a lot of work and it's kind of hard. But in JSON, it's difficult as well. And this is where something like um, a, a DSL in PowerShell, like like the, the DSC uh, is a DSL. DSC, the configuration keyword in DSC is a DSL, domain-specific language. And um, that one specifically would, would give you IntelliSense, telling you what is allowed and what's not allowed most of the time. And when you do this kind of data, you don't have this. The way I tend to make sure uh, it's fine, I have a lot of tests making sure, like pest the tests running. Whenever I save something, I'm just making sure that when I run uh, my compilation, for instance, the data is validated. And I know it's not ideal, and if you want to go further, then what you should probably be doing to give a nice interface and a nice ID is creating an extension to, uh, to your YAML file. If you do that in VS Code, that's probably the, the easiest. Probably not the best, but probably one of the easiest, which is already tricky, right? Yeah, that answer the question? Any other question? Yeah. Thank you very much. Right? Sorry, one second. Uh, we are meeting at 6.30 just outside of uh, this building, right? So the main entrance, all right? And then we will, everyone together, we will go to the zoo, which is only 10 minutes walk, not even 10 minutes walk. Thank you.